to my channel. My name is Cole Anderson. Uh, I just realized the other day that my channel has been up now for a full year. So in honor of the first anniversary of this very special project for me, I wanted to do something quite different from my usual fare and speak a little bit about improvisation. Improvisation, of course, is a little bit of a loaded topic for classical musicians in particular. A lot of classical musicians feel intimidated by the idea of improvisation and are either hesitant or unwilling to try it or just don't know how to even get involved in it. And there are some very natural reasons for this. In European classical music, there has been a gradual progression towards notational precision. In Europe, we started from the most generalized indications for realizing a musical performance. For instance, there was pneumatic notation, which is first found in the 9th century and probably originated with the Eastern Roman Empire. Pneumatic notation was used extensively as a shorthand method of supplementing the oral transmission of plain chants. It was only a supplementary method Method. These marks did not necessarily correspond to specific notes or rhythms in the way that modern notation does, but instead it indicated general shapes and groupings of notes, which would have been enough to guide the performances of these chants. So that's where we started. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the music of the early 20th century, up to the present really in many cases. Take for example, the notation of a page from a Mahler symphony, in which not only the exact pitch class and octaves are specified for each individual instrument within an enormous ensemble, but even the manner in which each individual pitch is meant to be realized is painstakingly indicated. The length of each pitch, the loudness of each pitch, details of timbre, overall mood, tempo, and so forth and so on. In fact, the precision at this point had reached such a peak of detail that it becomes almost impossible to truly realize each marking as fully as the composer may have imagined it. There are so many of them, uh, although you can certainly try, and that's precisely what conscientious executive musicians do. And of course, throughout musical history, we can find everything in between these two extremes as well. Composers in the Baroque era, for example, did not necessarily specify what instruments exactly they meant to be used. A prelude and fugue from the well-tempered clavier, for example, by Bach, could be played on a harpsichord, a clavichord, an organ, etc. Any keyboard instrument that was at hand, really. The term clavier merely referred to any keyboard instrument. So throughout the history of European classical music, as we were experiencing this kind of gradual progression towards notational precision and accuracy, a tradition oriented towards improvisation existed alongside this. In fact, all musicians in the 17th to early 19th centuries learned three things as independent but related skills. Singing and or playing an instrument, composition, and improvisation. Although there were certainly musicians who specialized and were known especially as performers, still they would also compose their own music as a matter of course. The reverse of this was also true. It was only in the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century that we really started to get non-performing composers. And this became actually fairly prevalent in the 20th century. So that a figure like Bartok or Rachmaninoff, who were themselves great performers of their own music, were kind of an exception rather than the rule often enough. So it's not my purpose to kind of take a moralistic stance here and to say that this is necessarily the way things should be, but I think that this kind of balanced approach towards the position of composition, improvisation, and performance in a musician's life revealed a kind of instinctive understanding that musicians of the period had of how these fields are interconnected. It wouldn't have occurred to them to train a musician to only perform without knowing how to compose how could you possibly understand a piece of music and perform it well if you had no experience in putting together a musical structure yourself and in stringing together consistent and convincing melodies and harmonies to create a coherent musical statement? At the same time, how could you really compose in a way that was practical and effective if you had never attempted to perform on any instrument or with your own voice before? Improvisation and composition nowadays are oftentimes viewed as being diametrically opposed to each other. 
The one requires a great deal of time and a careful revision to complete a piece of music. The music itself will only last a small fraction of the time that it took to transmit the ideas to paper and really put them in a final form. With improvisation, the layman imagines we are free from considerations of structure and other difficulties and everything just happens in the moment freely. And this is not exactly accurate because it takes a huge amount of background uh, in musical training to be able to have the uh, foundation to be able to improvise in a way that's convincing. In addition to this though, I'd like to draw your attention to the really subtle connection that does in fact exist between composition and improvisation. And I think that this connection is well underlined by the old adage that the aim of a composer is to write a work that sounds as if it was being made up on the spot. Great spontaneity is always what a composer really searches for to counteract the inherently planned nature of a composed out piece of music. On the other hand, it's often said that a great improvisation will sound inevitable. It will sound as if it couldn't have been any other way. In fact, it will sound as if it was a written down piece of music. Everything will seem to be in exactly the right place. And this whole problem was so obvious to the musicians of the 18th and early 19th century that even if a performer like Mozart or a Beethoven kind of performer was playing their own composition, which they knew perfectly well by memory, they would still generally have a score on the music desk and an assistant turning the pages for them. You know, why would they do this? to make it obvious that this was a true composition and not an improvisation. And during the course of the 19th century, when improvisation gradually kind of died out of the mainstream of classical music performance, what happened? People started performing by memory more and more, trying to uh, imitate the uh, feeling of an improvisation when they were actually performing a written out piece. At any rate, I think we can glean from all this history that the practice of composition forces the musician to consider aspects of structure, form, proportion. It forces the creative musician to think about planning and crafting inevitability. Improvisation, on the other hand, allows us to get in touch with our innate sense of flow, a kind of stream of consciousness experience of the moment. It really develops our sense of spontaneity and releases unconscious musical urges. And of course, it's absolutely not a simple dichotomy either. In between total free improvisation and strictly notated composition, there's a world of subtle combinations of the two, including things like the compositions of Frederick Jevsky, which almost always include openings for improvisation, or on the other hand, there's the highly structured improvisations of jazz. Uh, virtuoso jazz soloists, for example, oftentimes develop set pieces, which are improvisations that structurally are largely worked out, and which they only vary in details uh, relatively little from performance to performance, something which veers closer towards classical performance than most people would realize. Art Tatum, for example, the legendary stride pianist, was well known for developing these kinds of set pieces in his repertoire. For the classical pianist, it really doesn't matter particularly if you improvise for other people or if you compose pieces for other people to hear. All that really matters is the practice of at least doing these things sometimes because you develop instincts and understanding that inevitably serves you very well when you are on stage trying to communicate music to an audience. In particular, I always encourage students to improvise before a performance because I think that the uncanny way that improvisation can unlock our creative side is largely overlooked by the classical musician. Usually you'll see people drilling their scales and practicing their pieces obsessively to the last moment, but I always wonder what kind of inspiration and freedom is lost by people who are so conscientious about the details right before they're going on stage for this special encounter with their audience. I think instead we should be trying to uh, feed our inner creative spirit at that point and not be thinking about the nuts and bolts so much anymore. I love to encourage younger students or even older students as well who are looking for a way to charge their musical interpretations with more life color and meaning to try and channel the frame of mind that one has when improvising 
into a performance of a composition. So for example, to imagine that it's the first time that you're playing the notes of the composition in question, that these notes are spontaneously flowing out of your fingers as an improvisation. If the student is really able to imagine this sensation vividly enough, it almost always results in a strikingly more compelling performance. Something that was drab and kind of uh, student-like before suddenly becomes fresh and invigorating and interesting. Another aspect of this is that the approach required for improvisation also mirrors the shift in focus, which I think is really necessary for the performer when moving from practice to performance. It's essential that we leave behind our self-critical, detail-oriented approach to practicing our instrument and instead transition to a free, unhindered mode of playing the piano. The wonderful British pianist Stephen Huff compares this to being the engineer working on building a plane to the pilot actually flying the plane. You have to trust that everything is really there at that point. Another interesting source is uh, the wonderful Carl Czerny. Of course, Carl Czerny was a student of Beethoven's and the teacher of Franz Liszt. Uh, he has a really charming and delightful book entitled Letters to a Young Lady on the Art of Playing the Piano Forte. It's a fictional correspondence that he has with a young woman who's learning to play the piano. And he has a chapter on extemporizing, and he says, I quote, Extemporizing possesses this singular and puzzling property that reflection and attention are of scarcely any service in the matter. We must leave nearly everything to the fingers and to chance. So the classical pianist should improvise, but how? It's no problem for certain musicians, like the wonderful Brazilian pianist Gabriela Montero, for example, who you should definitely check out. Um, if you've been had an inclination to improv improvisation since you were a young child, if you've been trained in this field since you were very young, it's going to be no problem at all. But musicians who have not been trained in this way, who have not tried to practice this skill, musicians whose entire uh, musical life has consisted of practicing their instrument, playing compositions, as well as studying theory and ear training, etc. What do you do now that you're an adult and more self-conscious? Well, I think anyone can basically learn to improvise for themselves at the very least and I'd like to suggest a few basic methods and all these methods require is that you have some basic knowledge of the major and minor scales and being familiar with some of the basic harmonies so for example major and minor triads and dominant and diminished seventh chords um, I start with just these materials, although you can get as elaborate as you like, of course. But it's easiest for those who are kind of intimidated by improvising to start with easier materials. In fact, there's even a way you can practice it if you're a complete beginner on the piano and you don't know anything about scales or arpeggios yet. Uh, you can just try improvising on the black keys. And it's far easier than you might think, and you can get really beautiful things to happen with very little manual skill, particularly if you use the right pedal.
Then for the next step, you can try alternating improvising some on the black keys and some on the white keys. You can even mix one hand on one and one on the other. But for those of you who do have some basic theoretical knowledge of scales and chords, my next recommendation is to start by thinking in a linear fashion. So don't worry about harmony to start with. Instead, imitate the history of Western music in its outline and begin by simply improvising a lone melody by itself. One note at a time, whether in the right hand or the left hand. And to help select the notes for your melody, to limit yourself a little bit, choose one scale. For example, the scale of E major or C sharp natural minor.
as you noticed in that improvisation, I did two things to suggest an outline to what I was doing. First off, I started out by emphasizing more on the tonic, on E. And then towards the middle of the improvisation, I moved towards em emphasizing C sharp a little bit more, suggesting the relative minor key, which shares all the same notes with the major key. And this is a kind of a relationship that you see often in music. Then I returned towards emphasizing E again to conclude. Also, I included many shifts in register. I switched from the right hand to the left hand and back. I freely used the pedal sometimes and not other times. I included articulations, everything to give variety and color to the sound. I even kind of tried to have a loose motive, which I introduced at the beginning, and which I used and varied throughout the whole improvisation. All of that kind of stuff is just icing on the cake, though, so I would just start by stringing ideas together, and in time you can also try to make things as coherent as possible. And this is really very beautiful and enjoyable. I think we oftentimes forget how lovely a single melodic line can oftentimes sound on a piano, uh, with all the complicated counterpoint and harmonies that we usually have taken away. And of course you can refine this by introducing chromatic notes, modulating to other keys besides the relative minor. Uh, you might want to modulate to the dominant, scale degree 5, or to the parallel minor key. Anything is possible, but those would be some simple choices. Another thing you can do to expand your canvas is to move to two voices, one for each hand. So now we're in the world of box two-part inventions, although we don't have to be that strict, of course. So here's an example of that.
and notice that I don't always keep both voices moving at the same time. It's very natural to let one pause while the other has its say, creating a kind of back and forth dialogue. Occasionally having the voices move in the same rhythm can be a nice variant to add in, but it does remove some of the independence of our two voices if you do it too much. And of course you can move on to three voices or four voices as well if you want to. You can get as complicated as you like with this kind of contrapuntal improvisation. It's not hard to see how this kind of practice could easily lead the ambitious improviser to eventually improvising fugues. All you need is a consistent subject that appears in all the voices and returns frequently. Ideally it would inform the other material a, a little bit as well. And if you wanted to really sound like a Bach fugue there would be harmonic considerations but you know, you don't have to actually worry about that kind of thing at first, you can just try experimenting with improvising contrapuntally. The point of this kind of improvising is that we are gradually adding complexity and developing our sense of melody, which I think is a useful thing to do apart from harmony. If harmony is your only focus, you might end up creating kind of bland formulaic improvisations instead of ones where the vertical and horizontal aspect of the music is really well balanced. In musical history, harmonic practice developed from a basis of counterpoint, not really the other way around. However, once you get tired of contrapuntal improvisation, you can take a new focus with harmony. And with this, it might be wise to limit yourself, start with just a series of three or four chords, and play the chords a few times, just very simply, find a nice voicing, and then gradually start to expand the time that you spend on each chord. You can add arpeggiations, scalar melodic material, until at last you end up with an extended improvisation based on your three or four chords. Uh, then of course you can introduce any chords that you wish, including the extended harmonies that are common in jazz and other popular forms, and you can combine your understanding of contrapuntal playing with the harmonic approach. 
uh, this would enable you to create really elaborate improvs over time. Now, of course, this is only one approach, but I think it will repay you if you try it out. So please do give it a try if you're a pianist out there who's never improvised and you want to um, check this out. And leave a comment and let me know how it goes for you. I'm going to come back to this topic in future videos and come up with more ideas for how to improve improvisation. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Until next time.